I'm going to take you through a little bit of a presentation about some of the work I did on trafficking in persons in South Sudan at the beginning of this year. So just an overview of what I'm hoping to, to uh, I guess, impart to you today. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction into who I am and what I do. I'm going to take you through a little bit the national context of South Sudan, because I think a lot of a lot of the nature of South Sudan is what informs how the trafficking in persons um, crimes take place in the country. Um, and then we're going to also look at try and try to draw some broader lessons about how to conduct research uh, into trafficking in a fragile state like South Sudan. Uh, and, and I think there's lessons there for how to conduct research in general in a fragile state. Uh, because there are some uh, additional challenges, as you can imagine, uh, when, you're, when you're doing research in those kinds of places. Uh, and then we're also going to look at some of the findings of the study as well, the different forms of trafficking in persons in South Sudan, the factors that render people vulnerable to being trafficked, and then some aspects of the legal framework, counter trafficking response, and the recommendations that we came up with. Um, and also, you know, uh, we're going to have an extensive um, Q and A at the end, in the last twenty minutes of this of this uh, web webinar. Uh, but feel free if there are some, um, you know, clarification questions that you have during the presentation. You know, feel free to shoot them in the chat. And and I'm also going to be asking you some questions as well. And you, you can reply during you can reply in the chat function too. Um, so so yeah, just have your, I guess. Um, you know, you can already start to think, you know, what, what do you know about South Sudan and also, you know, how might that inform a methodology for any kind of study, particularly a study on migration and human trafficking in South Sudan. You know, try to already reflect on those points because they're going to be recurrent themes throughout this presentation. So, so just a quick introduction about, about myself. Um, so, you know, my name is Loxan and I am an independent research, an independent consultant. Uh, I'm from the UK, uh, but uh, I've been living abroad for, well, I'm based in the UK now. I'm, right now I'm in Portugal for a couple of months, escaping UK lockdown uh, and the weather. Um, but uh, generally I'm based in the UK um, and I'm an, I'm an, I've been an independent consultant for the past seven years, uh, particularly specialised um, in different forms of migration. Uh, I've worked on um, trafficking in persons, I've worked on the more kind of migration and development side of things, diaspora engagement, um, free movement frameworks uh, in Africa. I've worked in, I've worked across different geographies as well, Europe, Africa, Asia Pacific in particular. Um, and a lot, a lot across the African continent too. And uh, so that, what, what I mean by consultant, for those of you not so much in the know, uh, I do consultancy projects for mainly for international organizations, the International Organization for Migration, uh, IOM, and also for other United Nations agencies, governments, NGOs, and I've also uh, Work with some private sector clients as well. Uh, so, so that's kind of uh, my experience. And this, this is a, a picture. That, the picture that you can see here is um, from the South Sudan study. It was a little focus group that I did with some uh, women returnees, uh, re returnees from uh, a displacement camp in Uganda, uh, since this was at the southern border of South Sudan. Uh, and that was kind of one of the, the the research methods was doing focus groups with different uh, members of the community to to find out about um, the, the potential trafficking issues. So so that's about it in terms of uh, me. And and yeah, so I, I conducted this research in South Sudan for the International Organization for Migration uh, at the beginning of this year. It was a sixty day research consultancy. So uh, that that's also I think another thing that is interesting for you folks to uh, pay attention to during this talk as well, you know, what are the differences between research when you're an academic and uh, research when you are a consultant with X number of working days and a very specific time frame to, to complete the, the work. Um, it, it does change 
the way you look at research and the way that you shape the methodology as well. Uh, so um, coming on to uh, the methodology, let me just quickly see. Coming on to the, the what what we've tried to do, um, also just uh, Sohar, if you can um, flag if uh, if if any questions come in in the chat because I'm kind of looking at the PowerPoint, um, that would be great. Yeah, I'll keep an eye for you. Thank you very much. Uh, so just looking at the objectives of the study. So these are kind of the objectives of of the work that we set out to do at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. These are mainly set by IOM. And this is kind of what I had to work to. So the, of, of course, the overall outcome of all of this, the why in all of this is to strengthen South Sudan's trafficking in persons uh, response. Uh, and we want to do that by assessing trafficking in persons in South Sudan. So doing this, this study. Uh, and then there were some more specific uh, aspects to that that IOM were interested in like the prevalence of trafficking, you know, the, the kind of the scale, the level of trafficking in the country, the characteristics and the push and pull factors of trafficking. And also they wanted to set a bit of a baseline for their future uh, work, right? Because the function of organizations like IOM is to work with the, the, the beneficiary country, um, in this case, South Sudan, to strengthen their response so they wanted to have a bit of a baseline so in this study it was also about just outlining what was already being done or perhaps not done um not not being done to respond to trafficking so that they could look back later on to see what improvements were made uh, so a few questions for you folks and uh you know please do just respond in the chat don't be shy uh so can someone tell me what what human trafficking is, you know, and, and where it's defined? Let me go back to the chat so I can, uh, can see that. I'm going to stop my share temporarily so that I can see if anyone is, um, is, is, is coming up with any ideas. You know, what is human trafficking? How is it defined? And where is it defined? Um, I'll give a few people the chance to, to answer. Uh, but a, a clue is that it's defined, uh, it's defined by you know, uh, yeah, okay, we've already got a good answer there. So that's where it's defined in the UN Convention Against uh, Organized Crime, Transnational Organized Crime, the UNTOC uh, by the acronym, and the in particular, the Palermo Protocol. Uh, so there are two protocols on trafficking in persons and the smuggling of uh, migrants. Um, and can someone tell me what trafficking in persons is? Okay, well, I can uh, I can help you a little bit. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, hi, yeah, smuggling can indeed turn to trafficking. And uh, one of my questions is also going to be the difference between smuggling and trafficking. So, um, but they are indeed uh, related as well. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the kind of answer um, as to what trafficking in persons is. Because of course, if we if I'm doing this whole session on trafficking persons in South Sudan, it'd be nice uh, if everyone knows what trafficking in persons is. So trafficking in persons, uh, I'm going to uh, one second. Trafficking in persons, the definition in that protocol on trafficking uh, it comprises three aspects, three components. There are three components to trafficking in persons. One is an act. Two is a means and three is a purpose. Okay, and let me break that down briefly. So the first component is an act, and that would be the recruitment of, of someone, the, the harboring of someone, the transferring of someone, the transportation of someone. Uh, the means would be, um, you know, through co coercion or abduction, uh, deception. So you're, you're kind of taking someone, you're recruiting someone or transferring someone, using the means of, um, of, of, of deception or coercion for the purpose of exploitation. And uh, exploitation is one of those things which is a bit difficult to, uh, to define. But in the protocol, they specifically name certain forms of exploitation, uh, such as sexual exploitation, um, removal of organs, uh, slavery or similar practices, 
the prostitution of others. So in order to have trafficking in persons according to this definition, you need to have those three constituent elements. The only caveat there is that if children are involved, then there doesn't need to be the means. So there doesn't need to be any coercion or deception or, or, or anything like that for in order for child trafficking to be constituted, right? You can have a, a, a child trafficking case where a child is simply recruited for exploitation. So that's, that's what trafficking in persons is according to this UN definition. And that's what we stuck to throughout this study. There are various debates around the, the validity of this definition and, and this uh, protocol, this Paloma protocol that I've described uh, is now 20 years old. It came into effect in the year 2000. So there's a lot of debate going on right now, especially uh, in light of recent trends where we're talking a lot about modern slavery. Uh, so there's a debate about that, which goes beyond this, the scope of this presentation, but um, just thought I'd mention that so that you're aware. Uh, and so the second question is, what is the difference between trafficking and smuggling? The trafficking in persons and the smuggling of migrants. Can anyone uh, put any ideas in the chat there? I mean, what comes to mind when you think of trafficking? What comes to mind when you think of smuggling? The issue of consent, yeah, very, very good point, Elni. Because, yeah, indeed, um, with smuggling, you can, um, with, with trafficking and smuggling, well, actually, in trafficking as well, you can have cases where, where you initially consent to your recruitment. Um, and uh, so you can be a traffic victim of trafficking, but still have consented initially. Um, but indeed, smuggling, smuggling is, uh, is a kind of voluntary thing in, well, this debates around the, the use of that term, but uh, smuggling can be when you find a smuggler, when you find someone and you pay the money to take you across the border. So, you know, a, a few differences between trafficking and smuggling. And I, I also note, I want to note these differences too, because in South Sudan, throughout this study, the people we were speaking to, especially in the government of South Sudan, and, and this is an issue that I've experienced in many different countries that I've worked in, that people don't really understand the difference between trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. So trafficking is, as I've described, it has those three constituent elements, whereas smuggling is, um, is about crossing borders illegally. It's about the facilitation of uh, an illegal crossing of the border. Um, so, so in that respect, smuggling always involves borders for a start and trafficking can take place across borders and it can take place within a country and it can take place within an individual uh, community even. Um, so so that, that's kind of a little bit uh, of an intro to, to the definitions. Uh, and also another question is what sorts of um, challenges do you think there are uh, in trafficking research uh, or conducting research in general in fragile states you know so what 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 kind of challenges do you think i may have come across while doing this sort of work you know it's uh, um, okay patina very good 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 idea yeah honest answers getting honest answers from people so um yeah it's uh, trafficking is is a sensitive topic and uh we're going to talk about how a lot of it is tied into cultural norms as well. So it can be difficult to, uh, first of all, people don't really know what trafficking is. So you have to elicit different responses from people. Um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, people, people it's, it's something which takes place in a, in a hidden way. So you have to really work quite hard in, when you're collecting data to really uncover the cases. Uh, and of course, they're, they're, the perpetrators don't want to be caught as well. Um, victims of trafficking uh, don't want to face reprisals from their traffickers. So, so it can be very difficult. Um, what other ideas do we have here? Uh, this, yeah, r safety, uh, yeah, um, distrust in local government so people do not want to report it. Yep, so trafficking is very underreported. 
that's across the board, of course, and around the world, but particularly in places like uh, in fragile states where institutions are not built, there aren't really strong um, crime prevention, crime uh, law enforcement mechanisms. So people don't report their crimes. And part of that is also because if they do report their crimes, they don't, they don't, they go unpunished. They, they go on an impunity. Uh, danger to yourself, both from traffickers. Uh, yeah, there, there are, especially in fragile states where the, the, the line between law enforcers and law breakers can sometimes be very muddy, very gray, and there can be overlap. So a lot of vested interests uh, that, that don't want to, that don't want to be found out. Um, and victims not wanting to talk yet. That is a very important point uh, by Alessa there in the chat. Victims um, are hard to find and they're hard to, to talk directly to. And there are various do no harm principles which we have to adhere to um, in order to, uh, to collect data in an ethical way that doesn't um, render people, uh, you know, which doesn't cause too much trauma to, to people who have experienced so much trauma. Okay, so let's move on. I'm going to screen share again. Okay, so assuming you can all see my screen, but let me know if not. So that's just a, a visual representation of that trafficking in persons definition. So you have this act, this means and a purpose. The act, the recruitment, the transport, the harboring of, the means using coercion or abduction, uh, abuse of power as well um, for the purpose of, of exploitation. You know? um, so that's what we're talking about today. Uh, so in terms of the data collection, how we actually did this work. So we, we talked about some of the difficulties there. And I'd, I'd also underline that when you're doing trafficking research in an ideal world it, with unlimited resources and so on, to actually determine the prevalence of trafficking in persons, you need to do things like household surveys. Um, and there, there's another kind of, um, uh, the name escapes the the name escapes me, I think it's called multiple systems estimation or something, um, in order to, uh, to really kind of find out the prevalence of, of trafficking, you know, how many victims per, per X number of people of the population. Uh, as you can probably imagine, we, within the scope of a 60 uh, working day consultancy project, that's not very feasible. So we have to have quite a pragmatic approach to doing research. And what that boils down to in this case is doing the documentary review and then a stakeholder consultation. So stakeholder consultation being uh, the, the key informant interviews, talking to people, the focus group discussions. Uh, so, so, yeah, it's really about looking at all the documentation that there is on the topic and then, um, and then talking to as many people in the know as possible. So that's kind of what it boiled down to um, in, the, in the scope of this study. So uh, you can see that's quite a lot of research, uh, a, lot of, a lot of interviews, a lot of talking that, that we did. And, uh, and, you know, we looked at all the available documentation uh, there as well. Um, and we did some focus groups. Uh, so I think I, I, <laughs> I, think I realized that I... I uh, really underestimated the amount of time uh, that I'd have for this presentation. So I'm going to go, go through this fairly quickly. Um, so in terms of where you actually collect uh, trafficking data from. So as you can imagine, in a country like South Sudan, there really is just a dearth of data on pretty much anything. And in relation to trafficking, as, as we've said, there isn't really a, a you know, a lot of people don't really have the same understanding of what trafficking in persons is. And, and that was quite, that made it quite complex in that everyone I spoke to, I had to keep coming back to this definition. And usually people would think that by trafficking, I meant what was essentially migrant smuggling. So bringing people illegally across, uh, across the borders. Um, so in terms of where you actually uh, collect trafficking data from, the only real sources of information that you have 
in a case like uh, South Sudan are um, documents produced by other foreign governments and international organizations. And in particular, you have a, the annual Department of State, the US Department of State produces an annual report on trafficking in persons uh, with country chapters for pretty much every country. And that's conducted by the, the embassies and, and all these all the different countries. So those provide some short narratives um, about trafficking in a country. Uh, and for for this case, um, what, what, what you'll see in the findings, which I'll reveal to you in a moment, um, what you'll see as well is that in in order for us to find out about trafficking, we had to look in spaces where we know exploitation takes place and where there is some data. And so, and that boils down to things like um, child protection issues. So child, looking at child protection issues more broadly, and in particular in South Sudan, as you can imagine, there's a lot of child protection issues associated with the conflict and the use of children in armed forces and groups. And uh, we also had to look at a lot of gender-based violence uh, issues such as forced marriage. There is a bit of information on forced, uh, even forced marriage and, and also the use of women and girls in conflict as well, their exploitation there. Uh, so we had to really look in different areas where we know exploitation takes place and then to look at where those cases of child exploitation or gender-based violence might then uh, uh, equate to trafficking in persons. Um, and then, you know, uh, we also looked a lot at forced displacement, you know, um, when people are forcibly moved, uh, displaced due to the conflict in particular, because when people are on the move and displaced, they tend to be uh, vulnerable to being exploited, including to being trafficked. Uh, just a quick question for everyone, you know, what kind of limitations do you think uh, we would face in this kind of, uh, in this kind of research? Yeah, feel free to respond in the chat. Uh, yeah, access to respondents. Yeah, uh, indeed, um, it's pretty difficult to to find victims of trafficking to talk to for the reasons we've mentioned. Um, also, think about think about the the amount of time we have and also the vastness of a country like South Sudan and the inaccessibility. What, what kind of issues and challenges do you think that would um, lead to? Uh, okay, yeah, Talitha, very good point as well. Um, and Soha, yeah, about the local government and um, exactly, yeah, so the occurrence of trafficking in areas where there isn't existing knowledge and data. So, um, yeah, that's a very important point. You know, we, we only really had time to uh, research trafficking in two places, and that was the capital of Juba and the town of Nimule, which is along the southern border, a small southern border town. So, and those were both fairly, well, somewhat urban areas. Um, in a country like South Sudan, we're talking about a country in which outside the national capital, I think there is one or I think now two paved roads. So even to get to the southern border, we had to take a flight. Uh, you know, there's, there's cost in that and, and um, you know, going, and, and it's hard to get to different areas of the country. So we were only really able to do the study in two fairly urban areas in a country, a vast country, which is also vastly rural. So it was difficult to really get a representative sample there. Um, yeah, so those and, and yeah, cooperation of the local government, cooperation of all government uh, agencies, uh, especially when when you when you want to talk to go governments um, about about things which are very sensitive. Uh, South Sudan is also a very a country with a lot of different sensitivities as well, into ethnic, um, a lot of politics, and um, you know it's a country that's still in the process of institution building, so uh, a lot of difficulties in conducting research. Let's go back to the screen share. 
Okay, so in terms of stakeholders consulted, so we really tried to talk to everyone who might know stuff about trafficking. Uh, so uh, within the government, that was immigration, uh, directorate of public prosecutions, uh, which you know is the the, the organ charged with uh, directing investigations, criminal investigations, and so on. Uh, ministries of gender, um, labour, labour inspectors, you know, to, to look at cases of labour exploitation. Um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs to try and understand um, some of the uh, international cases, transnational cases of trafficking, um, because there, there's an element of international cooperation in that. Um, and also to look at cases of South Sudanese being uh, victims of trafficking being identified abroad. Uh, this NDDRC is this special commission in South Sudan that deals with the disarmament, uh, demobilization of, of children associated with conflict. Uh, and then, of course, the police, you know, uh, in a lot of countries, not South Sudan, unfortunately, in a lot of countries, uh, it's the police that um, uh, collect statistics on, uh, collect crime statistics uh, and, you know, do have some intel into trafficking investigations. In South Sudan, that's uh, not, not, not really the case. We couldn't get too much uh, information from, from the police authorities. Uh, international organizations uh, have a lot of, you know, they're collecting information on areas of relevance with them. So once again, we had to look not directly at trafficking, but also but at spaces where we know trafficking exploitation takes place, like child protection, like gender-based violence. So we had to speak with all these acronyms here, which are, you know, U United Nations agencies. You've probably heard of UNICEF, uh, United Nations Development Programme. The, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNMIS is, a, is the kind of South Sudan mission. Um, so they're doing a lot on, uh, on, on peacekeeping and, and so on. Um, and we spoke to different embassies. And that was not only to get intel, because the U US embassies uh, tend to, you know, since they're compiling this annual report, they tend to have a lot of good intel. But we also spoke with the embassies of uh, these different countries, uh, neighboring countries, because they deal with um, they provide support to uh, their nationals who've been exploited, including to trafficking victims and including, you know, uh, the, the repatriation of those victims and so on. Uh, and then we spoke to a lot of uh, civil society and the, the idea here, uh, we, it was very difficult to really identify um, trafficking victims. Uh, even in other neighboring countries, it is possible to speak with shelters that that shelter victims of trafficking. Uh, but because of the very low awareness about trafficking in South Sudan, we really had to talk to uh, organizations that, uh, that support people who, are, who have been exploited. So we spoke with uh, organizations that shelter, that help disarm and demobilize, de demobilize child, child soldiers. Um, we spoke with organizations that uh, support former sex workers and victims of gender-based violence and so we tried to collect different stories from these different people uh, people who work with uh, people who have been exploited uh, okay and, and in Numule, as i said we did we did a we did these consultations these in-field stakeholder interviews in um in juba at the national level the capital and then uh, Nimulek as well, so a, a southern border town. Okay, so that kind of visualizes how we how we did this this research. You know, so it's really a case of uh, collecting the data through looking at all the documents uh, that that are related to trafficking in South Sudan, and then talking to as many people as possible uh, within the government, within international organisations and NGOs, and then taking that data that we collect and analyzing it with respect to these specific areas of interest for, excuse me, for IOM. So the form, we looked at the forms of trafficking, we looked at the, the drivers of trafficking and the, the factors that render people vulnerable to being trafficked. We looked at the legal and policy frameworks in place in South Sudan, and then we looked at how those frameworks are applied and how, how what systems and arrangements are currently in place or we're currently not in place to address um, trafficking in persons. And then on that basis, we came up with some uh, key conclusions and recommendations. So uh, just um, 
going through this national context, uh, as, as you can imagine, um, South Sudan has really been shaped by its experience with, with, with conflict um, in, in recent years. Uh, it's, a, it's a country that became independent um, in 2011, so it's a very young country. And then since 2013 as well, it fell back into conflict and it's been in and out of conflict since. Uh, and that has led to a lot of forced displacement of more than 4 million people in a country of, of just over 10 million. Uh, and which, which, as you can imagine, is divided families. It means it, it's meant a lot of people moving on foot because as I said, there's not many paved roads. It's infrastructure is very poorly developed. So people are literally uh, fleeing their homes on foot. Um, and as you can imagine as well, all of that creates ex uh, spaces for exploitation, including uh, trafficking in persons. Um, and there's just been a whole host of human rights violations uh, across the country. Uh, and then, um, you know, because of the conflict and, and other factors and it's the, the, the youngness of the state, it's, it's, uh, it's got very weak institutions, weak law enforcement, weak criminal justice. Um, Trafficking is underreported, uh, and and there's there's very few resources available to support victims of trafficking as well. Uh, and it, it may come as a surprise to people. It certainly came as a surprise to me. But you know, when you think of a place like South Sudan, you don't think of it as a beacon of opportunity. But there are still people from uh, across across the world, and particularly from neighbouring countries, who still travel to South Sudan to take up employment opportunities. So that also shapes some of the trafficking issues that we found, you know, the fact that you do have a lot of labor migrants from neighboring countries coming in. Um, and then in addition to that, you have, you have um, a country with a, like many African countries, it has a lot of different ethnic groups and uh, those ethnic groups don't just stop at the borders of the country, the, you know, the colonial borders of the country but they also uh, cross, they straddle. You have a lot of communities that straddle borders as well. So like in many African countries, there are long-standing traditions of cross-border communities, cross-border living. Uh, and that means that some of these forms of trafficking that we found uh, also take place across borders. And you do also have some, um, some trafficking, uh, some transit migration that goes towards Europe. So you have migrants coming through from Somalia or through uh, from Eritrea, coming through Kenya, up from up through Uganda, uh, through South Sudan and then northwards onto Europe. And there are there are some smuggling and trafficking networks in place there, uh, which which in and in that context, we also came across a lot of stories of um, trafficking, you know, people being forcibly held in safe houses in Juba while waiting, awaiting their onward journey. Um, and yeah, just this last point about conflict, you know, you have, um, you have a lot of inter-ethnic conflict, inter-communal tensions, and uh, that, has, that has involved a lot of abduction. There's a lot of inter-ethnic abduction and, uh, and people are abducted for forced marriage or for forced, forced labor as well. Um, and that's a picture of the, the southern town of Nimule, that's the southern border with Uganda. I took this picture myself. Um, you can kind of see the, how informal it is in some ways. Okay. I think I am starting to run out of time, so I'm going to go quite quickly. So in terms of the forms of trafficking that we found in the country, um, th these are essentially the main forms. So. Number one is forced recruitment by armed forces and armed groups. Number two is forced marriage. Number three is domestic servitude and sexual exploitation. And number four is labor exploitation. So I'll just go through these uh, one by one quite quickly. Um, so forced recruitment by armed forces, armed groups and forces. So this is um, really involving uh, recruitment, recruiting of children into combat and non-combat roles. So we not only have uh, ch children recruited as soldiers, but also children recruited as uh, spies, as cooks, as watch, watch people. Um, uh, you have women and girls recruited into sexual slavery, uh, which is rife as well. And this, take, this is perpetrated by both state and non-state forces, which as you can imagine is quite difficult, makes it a difficult conversation when you're talking to the government about how they can enhance their 
um, trafficking response, while unfortunately state, act state actors are some of the perpetrators of trafficking in persons. Uh, and then, um, and, and this takes place, there are a few hotspots, uh, I won't go into those because uh, you can find these in the report as well. Um, and, and just to give you a sense of the scale, thankfully for this form of trafficking, there, there is a bit of data around and uh, collected by UNICEF and other United Nations agencies. Uh, so, you know, uh, we know that between 2014 and 2018, you had about 5,700 children recruited. Uh, some estimates by UNICEF go as high as, I think, 17,000 in terms of the number of children actually used in conflict. So it's, it's a big issue. Uh, forced marriage, women and girls are abducted and forcibly married in exchange for uh, a bride price uh, without the prior knowledge of the, the, the woman and girl or, or the parents sometimes. So sometimes it can actually be perpetrated by the parent or by, by let's say, an uncle. They, they would abduct um, uh, the child, oftentimes as a child, but it, you know, in, in, in this case it can be uh, adult women as well. Uh, and then they are, they're married off in exchange for, for, for money or for cattle. In, in South Sudan, it's, there's a big emphasis on cattle as well as a store of wealth. Um, and, then, and then that can take place in the context of inter-ethnic conflict as well. Um, it, it's a tricky one too because, uh, you know, how do you, there's some conceptual issues about how you define forced marriage because, uh, you know, to what it, how can you really gauge the agency of the, of the woman or girl in, in the situation, you know, that's quite difficult to, um, to determine sometimes. Um, so, but forced marriage is taking place across the country, very, very common. And, and just as uh, some representative quotes from the, um, uh, some of the people we spoke with, you know, once the dowry is paid, there is no way you can say no. Um, you know, and then, and then this third one, when someone forces a girl to marry in exchange for cows, is this trafficking? You know, um, those are the kind of questions we had from focus group participants because it's such a normalized um, act in, in the country. Uh, so then third, we have domestic servitude and sexual exploitation. Women and girls and boys are deceived into migrating to pursue employment, and then they are then forced into domestic servitude or sexually exploited. Um, women and girls may be forced into servitude or sexually exploited and married off with no means of escape. And women and girls may be deceived into migrating within the country or internationally with the promise of decent employment and then they end up as maids um, or, 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 or doing sex work. Um, and then fourthly, labour exploitation. Some of these, there are some overlaps, but the, the forms that we've defined here try to shine light on, I guess, specific issues that seem of most relevance to the, the, the local context. So labour exploitation, you have, um, you have a lot of migrant workers from neighboring countries, as I said, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and so on, coming to work in hotels in Juba and uh, or other cities, and they have their documents confiscated, and then they're subjected to pretty horrible conditions. Um, and, uh, and and then we have also some cases of children being forced to, to work in, in gold mining, other extractives, uh, trafficking cannabis, which also links back to some of the armed forces and groups and so on. Um, I'll just go a bit further into, so in terms of the national uh, legal and policy framework, um, in South Sudan they don't really have a uh, trafficking uh, law in place. Um, generally trafficking is, uh, uh, trafficking, the legislation surrounding trafficking can be found, either there's trafficking, specific trafficking law in some countries, or uh, there are provisions outlined in the penal code and various other legislation. In the case of South Sudan, there's some provisions in the penal code, the Child Act and um, the Labor Act, which tries to um, outlaw certain forms of trafficking. But um, what, what we found is uh, that trafficking is just really poorly defined in the legal framework. So in the legal framework of South Sudan, it just says that trafficking is uh, the bringing of someone across a border into southern into South Sudan for immoral purposes uh, and it's not really defined what immoral purposes are and um, in addition to that the penalties are very lenient as well so trafficking we found in South Sudan is poorly defined in the legal framework and there are very lenient penalties uh, so 
as you can imagine, even if cases of trafficking were identified, which they rarely are, um, they, are they go unpunished. So sorry to interrupt you, but we, um, we're running out of time. The time okay. of the presentation is over, but perhaps you could have like a minute or two for some concluding remarks. And uh, then we could um, discuss more the, the like parts of the presentation in the discussion uh, for uh, during the 15 minutes. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, 40 minutes goes very quickly, I find. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely want to come on some questions. So I'm just going to conclude with uh, a kind of word on the counter-trafficking arrangements in place. And when we talk about counter-trafficking, we usually talk about the three Ps or the four Ps. So the prevention aspect, the protection aspect. So preventing how to prevent trafficking, uh, how to protect the victims of trafficking of persons, and how to prosecute the perpetrators of trafficking. Uh, and what we find in South Sudan is that um, trafficking is very rarely reported by the victims of trafficking uh, because of a lack of confidence in the institutions, because of the the, the way that a lot of trafficking victims are stigmatized for their, their own exploitation. Um, and then when it gets to law enforcement, uh, law enforcers are very poorly resourced, so they don't really have the, the resources to conduct investigations. And investigating trafficking is very difficult, even in, in very developed high income countries like ours. Um, and then uh, there isn't really a proper criminal justice formal court system in place. A lot of cases are dealt with by customary courts, which are heard by village elders, village chiefs, and don't really discharge um, justice in a way that can really support victims. Um, and then there aren't really any, there are very few recourses to um, protection. There's very little protection available as well for people who have been exploited and been trafficked. Uh, the little protection that's available is often provided by international agencies who, who can't help everyone. Um, so that's kind of uh, about it um, for now. Uh, and you can, you can also, just as a conclu conclusion, or um, in case you want to know more, um, you can go to the, uh, I can share with you the link to the full report. And also there's a summary report in case you don't want to read all of it. And uh, there's also a podcast episode as well. Um, uh, specifically on, on this study. So I can share those uh, links with you uh, in the chat. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for listening to the, the, the presentation and I'd be very happy to field any questions. Thank you very much, Luxan. This was very interesting and very beneficial. Um, so, so I don't take much uh, of the discussion time. Perhaps if someone has any questions, they could use the um, uh, raise the hand button, um, and then uh, and you could also write your question in the chat box if you would like to. Uh, go ahead, Talita. Hi. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, thank you, Luxan, for such an interesting presentation. Um, I was particularly intrigued by this idea of um, forced marriage as a um, as a kind of trafficking, and I wondered. And with regard to what you were saying about the difficulties in in doing research in this area, particularly when people don't have a very good understanding of what trafficking is. So I was wondering how you approached that in your focus groups, where you are when you tried to. Um, work with the, your, your focus group participants to distinguish between maybe arranged marriages and and forced marriages and, and as trafficking. So I wanted I wondered whether you could elaborate further on that. It's, it's an excellent question, uh, Talitha. Thanks for that. Uh, it is it was indeed very challenging, and I think the way the approach that we had throughout was to really stick to this United Nations definition of trafficking in persons. And in that respect, what, what we do, especially with focus groups, you know, is to go through that definition of trafficking in persons. So if someone said to me, uh, oh, um, there's this case where I had this friend who was, uh, who, who was, you know, the uncle paid, uh, married them off in exchange for a price, I would say to them, you know, let, let's, look, let's look at this together. Uh, so, so what happened, um, you know, we talked about the three constituent elements of trafficking, the means, the act, the act, the means, and the purpose. You know, is the, let's talk about the act. Is the act there? Was this person, was this child taken without, um, you know, knowing beforehand where she was going? Uh, 
okay, yes, um, you know, what, what, and, and when, when we talk about that situation, there's also a bit of deception there, right? So you have the act and the means, you have that recruitment, the abduction, uh, you, have, um, you know, so you have the act and the means already, and then the exploitation. I mean, that's really the hard part to talk about, you know, is, is someone who's being married off, uh, forcibly married off, is she being exploited? You know, I mean, I would argue, I personally would argue that, um, uh, you know, if someone's being forcibly married off and then uh, expected to do all the things expected, uh, expected to do all the things that husbands in South Sudan expect them to do, uh, then that is a form, that is exploitation. But uh, you're right, it's, it's a difficult one to, to really talk through. But I tried to just um, focus on the UN definition and then discuss it collaboratively with the focus group participants to see if the three constituent elements of trafficking are present. Okay, um, quite a couple of, shall, shall I answer the questions from Esther? Go ahead. Okay. What is the answer to the question about giving a cow as a bribe? Well, uh, again, so if, if, if you're giving uh, assets, again, it is quite difficult to, to really discuss this because there are some cultural uh, elements to this. But uh, in a case like South Sudan, if, if an uncle uh, kidnaps uh, abducts uh, their their niece, and um, even without, let's say, even without the parents knowing, they abduct their niece without the parents knowing, uh, and give their niece to someone else in exchange for assets. Um, for for me, this is uh, you know the, the child being sold, right? Um, and I think according, I think there's consensus as well that in these kinds of situations are in line with the UN definition on trafficking. Any other questions? I have a question, but I can uh, I can be the last one to ask about the <laughs> other. Yeah, uh, Virginia, you can go ahead uh, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, thank you for uh, speaking to us. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the prevalence of um, which one is more prevalent, rather, whether it's more prevalent for people to be trafficked within South Sudan or for people from South Sudan to be trafficked outside of the country. Uh, very, very good question, Virginia. And I think it's important. It's a very important point as well because generally in South Sudan and in other countries that I've worked in, people tend to associate trafficking with, um, you know, like uh, international sex trafficking rings and things like that, which are important, of course, but uh, the vast majority of trafficking worldwide takes place within national borders. And that's definitely the case with South Sudan. So most trafficking in South Sudan takes place within South Sudan, for sure. Um, yeah. Thank you. How do we ensure the safety, uh, my safety and the safety of the people that you've interviewed? Um, yeah, I, it's, <laughs> that, I mean, we, we just try to err on the side of caution all the time. We, we um, try to speak more with uh, those who had worked with victims of trafficking. So, you know, NGOs um, uh, more than speaking with uh, directly with victims, especially because different victims of trafficking are very hard to, to identify and there are there are as i said at the beginning various um uh, ethical considerations around surrounding trafficking uh, speaking with trafficking victims um yeah uh, there, there there is really no easy answer to this though except that you you have to just kind of um uh, work out your own level of risks um obviously working with iom iom they they risk assess everything and and so uh, you know, every, all of my movements and everything were being managed by them and assessed, risk assessed by them. There were a few times, for instance, where I asked some difficult questions to, uh, to, to um, especially to military people, to, in, to security officials. Uh, South Sudan is a very um, security intense country, so there are um, security officials, intelligence officials everywhere. Uh, and they're always looking on with suspicion. So, um, you know, there were probably cases where there was a, an element of risk, and um, but I just tried to manage it as best as best I could. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions?
Maybe I can ask my question. Oh, great, yeah, please. <laughs> So I know that in South Sudan, there's always um, the dynamics of uh, ethical relationship. Um, um, yeah, like the, the tribes. So I know that the Dinka and the Nwe are the main two groups in, the, uh, in South Sudan. But according to many articles, is that the Dinka are constantly uh, attacking other minority groups. I would say like just like the, uh, the rebel groups or the militia groups. So I was wondering if you have uh, looked into the uh, like the tribal dynamics in uh, trafficking uh, so whether like women from uh, uh, minority groups or specific areas in south sudan are more at risk of trafficking than others uh, that, that's a, an interesting point um so and there is a big inter-ethnic dimension to it it's, it's actually very difficult to to get a very complete to get a complete picture of this because there there's so much uh, misinformation about the tribes and the, the inter-ethnic conflict as well. The Dinka are the, the kind of most dominant tribe, so there's uh, a lot of Dinka in positions of authority uh, at national level. Um, they're, they're actually, I, I, the only case in which I heard about one tribe um, kind of being, being um, disproportionately involved in abduction was the case of uh, the Mullah, um, the Murla uh, ethnic group, uh, and it, and it is. I, I actually thought about writing about it in the report, but I didn't. And the reason is this: uh, a lot of different tribes and people in South Sudan seem to to say, "Oh, the Murla are always abducting people. The Murla are just trying to make uh, like the Murla." The, there's a belief that the Murla people have um, poor inf have poor fertility, so they would abduct members of the other tribes to uh, boost their population numbers. But I, 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 I had the sense that there wasn't really much data about it, that it was a lot of it came down to the kind of um, uh, ingrained uh, stereotypes um, about certain tribes. So for that reason, I didn't really uh, write about it. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know. It's difficult. It's really difficult to tell. If if there are um, if there's more trafficking being perpetrated by certain groups, which is why I kind of uh, stayed away from it. But there are certain. Uh, what I can say is that there are certain ethnicities that straddle borders. Um, so there are ethnicities that straddle Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and so on. So trafficking can take place, especially when we talk about forced marriage. They can they can take place across the borders in those cases. Thank you very much. Um, I see a question from Dorothy. Yeah, thank you so much, Loxan, for your presentation. Uh, as you're presenting, I saw that you talked about trafficking. It can also involve the state, for example, maybe recruiting young people to go to join the army. And uh, maybe you're doing a research and you want to find out about this. So I think uh, sometimes you, you can also face a challenge, like when you interrogate the government, you want to get information maybe from the CID. I think it, it is also very difficult for the government to give you full information. And also participants also can have a fear of reporting such since it's the state involved. So I think maybe how do you handle such a scenario and how do you get right facts since people have the fear of the state and, yeah, and also to get the right information. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, again, yeah, it comes back to some of the earlier earlier points I made in that um, I, I considered my role as the researcher to ask ask the questions. Uh, well, in terms of the the getting participants to to um, talk about it, uh, it was more about eliciting responses from them um, rather than asking them directly. You know, have you been trafficked? Uh, who do you know who's, who's been trafficked? Because as we as we've discussed, uh, no one really understood what trafficking persons meant. Um, so that's kind of I'll revert to my answer there in terms of the participants, and uh, in terms of the talking to the state, it it comes down to my role as the researcher was to ask questions, and um, there there are there are people uh, you know when we talk about the state right it's it's not just one thing it's not a monolith. There are a huge variety of voices, some of which um, see bad things going on and want to, to, to talk about them, and others who want to stick to official lines or who are um, worried about uh, jeopardizing um, 
vested interests. And so there were some people who spoke frankly about some of the crimes they'd seen. And once I'd described, once I'd gone through the, um, the, the definition of trafficking to ensure that the person I was talking to knew what trafficking was, they then came forward with various stories that they'd come across. Uh, a lot of this research was really about um, triangulating anecdotes, right? Listening to stories and working out what were the recurrent stories. It, it may seem a bit unscientific to, to researchers, to academics like yourselves and, you know, to, to any good researcher, but uh, that's kind of the pragmatic uh, methodological approach that we had to take. Any more questions? I'm here for as long as you want me, so you know, uh, feel free to ask any questions or, or contact me later on. Uh, okay, so I'm, re I'm reading the, the question. Uh, future to look into this and discuss with us further. Uh, I found it so interesting with the 40 minutes. Oh, I have to completely then. Yeah, I, co uh, I completely get that the 40 minutes um, are sometimes not enough, but most of the people that are attending are on a very tight schedule. So we try our best to. Uh, uh, to host seminar um, seminars, migration seminars, and uh, to include uh, different topics and bring to the uh, institute uh, different researchers with uh, very diverse background. But unfortunately, most people do not have more than one hour to um, nowadays, especially that everything is online. Um, but yeah, however, and, and also just to, just to add. The link to the podcast episode will allow you to listen to this for a full hour if you want to know more. And and obviously, as as I said earlier, you you're welcome to to get in touch if you have uh, more questions. Um, I, I I don't see um uh, Alessar's question, but or are you oh, sorry? Oh, um, ah. did I observe any improvement. Uh, so uh, presumably you mean in, in terms of the trafficking response in South Sudan. And so uh, I would definitely have liked to have talked about that a bit more, but, but obviously we are limited by our time. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's early days. Um, so I just did this trafficking study. This was just published a few months ago. So uh, the next step is IOM's doing various work to build capacities of law enforcement, to, um, and also one thing that's taking place at the moment is that uh, a, a counter-trafficking committee has formed in government. So it's like an intergovernmental, inter-ministerial department bringing together everyone involved in trafficking. So immigration, uh, law enforcement, military, um, child protection, you know, social welfare agencies to, to and, and the next step is to, uh, is to reform their legal system so that they actually um, recognize trafficking within their legal system and criminalize it properly. So uh, th those are kind of the next steps and it will take time for, for us to really see um, impact. Um, so yeah, so I hope, hope, hope that answers your question. I'm very sorry, Alisa, I missed your question for some reasons. Um, but thank you all for attending and uh, thank you very much, Roxanne, for uh, uh, this presentation. And I would have absolutely loved uh, to hear more about it. But I personally read the report and it's very interesting. Thank you. So I would say many of the questions that uh, you could possibly have would be in the report. Very well written and I really enjoyed reading it. So thank you all again for uh, attending. And um, yeah, again, we try to host two uh, migration seminars per month. And hopefully very soon, uh, I will announce the migration seminars of December. Thank you again, Luxan. And yeah, yeah I'm, just, uh, I'm just writing my website in, in the yeah. chat in case anyone wishes to get in touch. But you know, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you all. And, and um, uh, yeah, just reach out if you have any questions. But yeah, and thank, thanks so hard for, for moderating, for organizing, and thanks for you and you, Merit, for having me. Thank you very much. We're so happy to have you, and hopefully we can have you again in the future. Thank you. It'd be nice to come back. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.